In this week's show, we discuss the concept of the Trinity in biblical theology. The focus on the subject arose from the question, is it possible to understand the nature of God from biblical sources? We address this issue by comparing Jewish and Christian approaches to describing or defining God. One author discussed is Dr. Michael Heiser, once interviewed on our show regarding the ancient astronaut theory. In his presentation based on his dissertation titled The Divine Council on Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature, he discusses how, based on both ancient linguistics and biblical mysticism, the Trinity existed in pre-first century theological ideas found in the Bible. We explore the traditions that led to the two powers in heaven theology and how the early church fathers developed theological concepts which could be considered to be inconsistent with the ancient Israelite worldview portrayed in the Bible. The reason that, that, um, that this is important is because we can't really comprehend God. God, um, there, one of the guys that I'm going to be quoting, he says that the, the name for God or the word that describes God in the Hebrew Elohim is plural, and it's not plural because it's compounded or it's a family. It's plural because it's something that you can't uh, contain. So um, water in Hebrew is Mayim. So water is in plural. Why? Because water changes, and water can be from a drop to an ocean to a piece of ice. So it's, so it's uh, some type of uh, natural force that, that it is um, difficult to, to grasp. The same goes for the heavens, uh, Shamayim. Shamayim is in plural because the heavens, uh, we don't know what's past, you know, the atmosphere and like go into the universe. So the same thing goes for God. God is not plural because uh, of this preconceived notion that he has revealed himself in three persons. But God is plural because he is um, unmanageable. Like he's, 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 a, he's a force, is a, a being that has no limits. So when we are discussing this, this difficult subject of the nature of God, we have to compare the two approaches, the, 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 the ancient uh, Hebrews, Israelites, or what we call the Jews, uh, versus the Greco-Roman church fathers, because we have people who have come from different perspectives. So one is, an, is a narrative, you know, the Torah and the, the writings, and the prophets, it's a narrative that it talks about our relationship with God. And you describe that relationship. So if you see symbols of God in the Bible, they say that he's a rock, that he's a mountain, that he's a king. So he, there's things that we can relate to. In, in philosophical terms, from a greco Roman perspective, it's trying to define God and trying to describe him. So now you not only have... Um, so the Jewish one is to describe him, the Hebraic one is to describe him, the greco roman one is to define him. So now you got to say, well, God is this compared to that. And I mean, even Maimonides did that. He said, God is not this, God is not that. So he used the negative theology to define God. So the Greeks decided to, to take the, the three, um, you would say, you know, from, from a Christian standpoint, three manifestations of God. God is an old man uh, sitting on, on the throne in both Isaiah and the book of Daniel. Uh, God, or the Son of God, as a young warrior or a meek uh, Messiah, or even the warrior of Revelation, and that's another manifestation. And then they have this idea of spirit, which is something that, that brings about prophetic uh, utterances or dwells within the Jewish people of the tabernacle or the temple or it guides the apostles in their many journeys and their confrontations with other uh, people. So all these expressions of God's presence are, are being um, connected to one another in this almost mathematical way of trying to understand God. But again, can you really do that? Later in Jewish tradition, you see that with the different attributes of God, and the way that um, the emanations are described by the Sefi wrote in other um, mystical works. So there's this, um, it's funny that when people don't like what someone's saying, 
uh, about God, they say that they are the stuff is weird, or that the stuff is um, is a form of um, assuming things. Or um, there's a term that that is used by multiple authors. They they're theorizing or something like that. It's like it's very condescending stuff. Like, well, you think that God is like that, but I know how God is. It's like that's the biggest issue. How can anybody claim that they understand God? And it's speculation. So they say, oh, they're speculating. It's like everybody's speculating because we have limited information. And one thing that that Dr. Heiser does in his presentation is that he doesn't explain how the authors of the, the Torah or the writings or even the New Testament, they were all taken in whatever experience they had and and they were processing it and and then they were writing it putting it on paper so there's the human element of of communication where you're taking in something you're processing it and you are interpreting it and you're trying to put words to what you saw so if someone goes to heaven and speaks to the angels or the messiah or god that itself cannot be documented because it's an experience that is beyond human um, the human senses. So for them to come down and try to talk about it, it's almost like a traumatic experience. So it's going to be a disjointed thing. And he makes a big deal about how in one passage, um, Ezekiel or somebody says that he was talking to God. And then the, in the next verse, he's talking to the spirit. And the spirit is taking him up, and then in the other one, he's talking to the angel, and then the the, the man that looked like um, a furnace comes, and on the other one, and it's just like it's because he's kind of struggling, or, or doesn't know who he's talking to, or he has multiple entities uh, discussing with him. That doesn't mean that all those entities have the same hierarchical um, authority or power, and that's really the challenge of this idea that. God is multiples because now you're saying that they're all equal based on, on what? Based on a couple of verses. Um, the the whole case that multiple authors make is that there was a divine council. So now you have Elohim not only being God, but Elohim being multiple uh, divine beings. And through Christian uh, theology, there's always been multiple divine beings in the sense of you have angels and archangels and, and guardians and uh you know all like demi um you know powerful things and you have the same thing with in the levels of hell and different beings now that's a lot of speculation and even in the talmud it talks about how in hell there's these angels that carry whips that look they're like electrical cords and they whip people and some of that could have been influenced by the greek uh idea of Hades and, and the torture that people go through there. Um, but when you go to the heavenly realm, or what is called the Hekalot literature, where there's a lot of books where they discuss the, the heavenly realm, you see a lot of contradicting ideas and, and stuff because they're trying to make sense of a realm that, that we haven't experienced as human beings. And there's stories where people go up there to where it's called parties or paradise, and they see different things, and they have different experiences. So when we're talking about God being embodied in these um, revelations or in these manifestations, you know, you can think of a monotheian approach and say, oh, it's, it's figurative or it's uh, a dream or something like that. Or you can take a literal approach and say that everything was substantiated, physicality, or some type of essence that you can describe and, and define. So now if they see an image of, of a man on the throne, they're going to jump at the conclusion that, well, God must have a body. And that was a huge debate in, uh, in Jewish history. Does he really have a body or not? And then they say, oh, well, of course, it's the body of Jesus. Because Jesus is a human. Yeah, but Jesus is a human after the fact. So he go back in time and, and, and created flesh and, and bone and skin? Or did he have some primordial body that later was manifested in the flesh um that's the stuff that they don't think about and and it becomes almost fantastical if you start thinking about it because now we're talking about um, you know manifestation becoming uh 
um, organic and then the organic material going back into uh, the divine realm and can it really exist in a divine realm. Uh, even Jesus said that the angel, the, in, the, in the world to come, people will be like angels. So if you're like an angel, what does that mean? Angels can manifest themselves in human physicality according to uh, the Tanakh, but um, there's only certain things that, that it should tell you that they do. Uh, the three that appear with Abraham, they, they ate. So they're, they don't need to eat, but they ate because they wanted to be hospitable and nice to their host, or they actually were able to process their food. Um, so it's just a lot of very difficult stuff to even discuss because you, know, you can say almost in a comical way, we weren't there. Um, and that's how he perceived it. So, um, and then the Christian would say that one of the angels was God. So it's like, is it God or is it an angel? Which one is it? So um, Paul Sumner makes a, a, a good case that Jesus was never called an angel. So when people say that Jesus was the angel of the Lord that appears in the passages in, the, in Genesis, um, you don't see that in the New Testament. The New Testament was never, never describes him as an angel. And it wasn't until the second century where people started using that term and applying it to Jesus. To get that point across as well is that uh, we're not bashing the Trinitarian perspective. What we're doing is that we are saying that that's not the only kind of outcome of biblical information. So if, if you make an assumption or a conclusion based on what you see, that's perfectly acceptable. The question is, is there a consistent uh, communication of the same idea? And we can get really, uh, um, the word is cynical, and start breaking down all the different approaches that are for, um, for God throughout the whole Bible. You can say that, you know, there, there's scholars that would say that one camp had an idea of God as something, and then another camp had an idea of God as something else, and they didn't like each other. So in the same book, you have people who are pushing for God being Elohim, and then there are other people who are pushing for God being El Shaddai, and then someone else saying that he's just El. And each term they use means something else to different people. But since we believe that, that it's a revelatory uh, scripture, we know that all these different ideas are not competing, but they're complementary. So you can have a God who's nurturing, like El Shaddai, then you have a God who's vast, like Elohim, and you have a God who's, uh, you know, the warrior or the young um, artist, and they're all the same God because he's multifaceted, just like we as human beings are multifaceted. It's not different gods or different uh, ideas of God. And that's where I think people uh, get confused. And then when it comes down to the New Testament, we can say that there's multiple conceptions of Jesus. So it doesn't mean that there's... There was a lot of different Jesus who appeared and lived among men. But there's Jesus, the Jesus as a man was interpreted by different people in different ways. So if you came from a camp that was mystical and you saw a gentleman that proclaimed that he was the Messiah, you would say, well, that makes a lot of sense because mystically, uh, you know, God will bring about uh, a great uh, teacher who, who will change the hearts and minds of people. And then if you were a, a more rationalist, you say, well, yeah, but prove it. Because just because you say or you do some miracles, that's not uh, consistent with what I understand from the scripture. And someone else can say, well, yeah, but uh, the ways of God are, are so vast that we can't fully uh, decide who is and who's not because there could be multiple people with multiple powers. And uh, it's, you know, it's kind of a matter of the heart or personal revelation. So there's a lot of different approaches that you, that you could take to that in the, in the individual messianic figure or all messianic figures who have uh, appeared throughout the centuries, as well as uh, the way that God has communicated his message to the different prophets of different people. Um, so for the next 15 minutes, I just want to bring up a concept that is kind of new to me but I, I want to kind of address it. So one way that the early rabbis discussed God that made sense for them was uh, talk about this two-power 
idea in relation to uh, an angel that is not necessarily the angel of the Lord, but it's an angel that becomes a mediator between us and God. Philo, who was a philosopher of, of Alexandria, Egypt, who was before Paul and Jesus, he spoke of the Logos, and to him the Logos was a created being. Well, an, an term that is used for the Logos, and that is the Word of God, is meta, Metatron, and uh, that character uh, comes up in some rabbinic literature, and is um, he is part of the issue with two powers. Uh, there's different stories where people see Metatron or the Word of God sitting in the throne or being um, manifesting himself physically in some way, and they get confused and they think that he is God because he bears the name of God. So then they get chastised for doing that. And some people will assume that that's a anti-Christian um, like polemic, but it, it has to do with this idea that God used intermediaries to talk to people throughout the, the, the Torah. Uh, so some people think the Metatron could be Moses, it could be Elijah, it could be um, Enoch, who was the man that didn't die in the book of Genesis, and then other people think it's the Logos. So just if I mention Metatron, just know that he's kind of like, he takes in the place of this intermediary that in Christian circles is Jesus. Uh, and then you can say, well, does Metatron Jesus? I don't know, because Metatron is discussed in later rabbinic writings after uh, you know, Jesus uh, being around. So there are different books of Enoch. There's first, second, and third Enoch, and he's mentioned in third Enoch. Um, and Enoch is one of the most mystical books that kind of is the foundation of uh, modern monotheism in the sense of all use Enoch to help them understand the universe uh, and, and the different levels of heaven and stuff like that. Um, the rabbinic uh, writers used Enoch as kind of helping them also understand the angels and, and the demons and stuff like that. So uh, Metatron is sometimes associated with Michael, the angel. And I was reading that um, the angel of the Lord is actually uh, in the New Testament is associated with Gabriel. So how can the angel of the Lord be Gabriel and Jesus at the same time? Um, Metatron is also related to the, the palace or, or Shaddai, you know, God is uh, as a nurturing uh, ruler. Um, have to deal with um, all these things called the Targum or the Targumim. There are um, Aramaic versions of the Bible. So they would take uh, a Bible uh, book and they would translate it. And as they translate it, they would change words and find meanings within the stuff. Um, so that's where you get a lot of this wisdom theology where wisdom is personified. So the Targum are Aramaic versions of both the Old and the New Testament, the New scriptures and the, the teachings of Jesus through the apostles. So, um, but they take a lot of liberties with the text. And that's what Christians are, are not usually aware that um, even the writers of the New Testament take a lot of liberties with the text. So if you, if you have people debating scripture and they say, well, you know, my New Testament says this about Jesus, and then someone else says, well, my uh, Hebrew scriptures or the Nike says this about the passage, and it doesn't correlate with what's in the, in the New Testament. It's like, because there were different versions. So the it is believed that the New Testament passages that are quoted are from Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Tanakh, the only issue is that there might be a Greek version of the Septuagint, a uh, Hebrew version of the Septuagint. So people assume that it's in Greek, but maybe there was a Hebrew version of the Septuagint. And what I mean by that is that it was translated to Greek and then trans retranslated back in Hebrew because there are different interpretations. And the interpretations are made into the text. 
Same goes with Dragon Me. Dragon make their own allusions to Lady Wisdom and other things that they find fitting. And, when, and the reason we know that is because there was Aramaic and, and other texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they are side by side with the Hebrew, they, they have little changes. But they're changes that are sectarian. That means that people are applying those passages to themselves, so they are reinterpreting them to fit what they're experiencing. And that's what you see in the New Testament, and it's not foreign or weird to do that. It's something that religious groups do because they're trying to make sense of their experience. Um, and then there's issues about, you know, can God, can someone sit next to the throne of God, um, the idea of a viceroy, so now you have God um, handing down or delegating his authority to someone else. It's interesting that um, the question in um, in Daniel is what's usually quoted, where you have the Ancient of Days, uh, and then the Son of Man, the Son of Man comes, and he's given authority over heaven and earth, and it's like he's about to sit on the throne. There's actually a passage in the Talmud that talks about uh, the Son of Man in the Ancient of Days, and according to Daniel Bujarin, who is the academic that most people quote, he says that that is actually related to some type of Canaanite um, monarchical uh, relationship between two, uh, you know, pagan deities or uh, foreign deities. And Michael Heiser does something similar where he appeals to Canaanite religion to make a case for his divine council that is supposed to be that support room. Uh, I find that very problematic where, you know, you go from being academic to being um, syncretistic. So you can say there's correlations, connections between different religions. We start saying that there's an element from a foreign religion within the religion of, of children of Israel. And that's what we've been uh, discussing and, and, and claiming for years that Christianity was not uh, influenced by paganism through the Greeks. It was, it was, uh, native to Judaism. Now they're saying that Judaism was pagan to begin with because it had pagan ideas in it, such as God being multiples or God having children and things like that. So then it just it gets all convoluted and like makes no sense at the end. Uh, I think there's a way to salvage these things and you just have to look a little bit deeper. And it's not uh, w wishful thinking that you want it all to fit perfectly and the religion not to have any issues. <clears throat> but there's some consistency within, within the perspectives. I've heard all kinds of crazy theories where Zoroastrianism influenced Judaism and then Christianity, Babylonian religion influenced uh, both, um, Mithras called the Greeks. Uh, they say that even though most people believe that the Talmud and the rabbinic writings were in opposition to Greek thought, and they're actually very influenced by the Greeks. And there's a book called Aphrodite and the Rabbis that even says that there's even more stuff in there that, that people haven't uh, realized. So it's just it because of free-for-all. Um, and again, we are bringing this up from a religious perspective, but a religious perspective that it is reasonable, educated, and scientific to a certain point. So there has to be some academic uh, integrity and academic uh, understanding that things do, do develop over time, but uh, these foreign elements are not there's, the easiest solution is to say, oh, it's just much bigger stuff all mixed together. It's like, but do we find that, and is that a consistent thing? Um, before we go, I want to mention that I wrote a paper about the early Jewish Christians or followers of Jesus, whatever you want to call them, and, and it talks about how um, the book of uh, Revelation, uh, one scholar believes it was written by John the Baptist, it's not by John the Revelator or John the Patmos, and then another scholar says that um, even though that's a little far-fetched, there are some things that that, that uh, scholar brought up that are important. She said that if you look at um, the way that the, there's, there's these type of uh, almost um, mantras or uh, phrases that are being repeated in the book of Revelation, like uh, there's something about they follow one God and one Lord and things like that that it's easy to take out the part about the Lamb or the Messiah, like the Christ. So if you say, you know, the, the elders bowed down before the throne, like you can just leave it at that. 
and then they added and the lamb. So that possibly the book of Revelation was an ancient Jewish text that was uh, doctored to um, to add the, the perspective of Jesus being the Messiah. And again, that was a common practice. Um, so if that's the case, the book of Revelation can give us an earlier version of Hekalot literature. And what I mean by that is that it talks about thrones, it talks about it was like a palace in New Jerusalem, things that were still kind of in development or not fully fleshed out within Judaism. So there's certain things you can find in the New Testament that are that are kind of very mystical and very uh, powerful that, uh, that are part of, of, of Jewish um, expressions or understandings of God. And there's a story in the Talmud about the four rabbis that go up to a party, so or paradise, and it says that um, they um, they heard something or they saw things. They say that, that what Paul describes as his going to the third heaven is very similar, and there's a difference between seeing God and hearing Him and the way that it affects you. We've been talking about the Trinity and. We- we we're talking about Jewish ways to uh, address these uh, passages where they talk about multiple persons or characters in place of God or as manifestations of God. And we we're talking about the Jewish angel of the Lord in a sense that is Met- Metatron. Now we're talking about the angel of Hashem uh, that comes up in the Bible. So if you look at, at the Malach of, of Adonai, uh, he appears in Genesis 16, 7 through 14, um, to Hagar when she's in the desert. He appears to Abraham and refers to God in the first person. Uh, that's the one where they say that he was one of the three angels, that God was one of the three angels. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 4, the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a flame, and God speaks from the and that speaks to Moses from the flame. In Numbers 22, 22-38, the angel of the Lord meets the prophet Balaam on the road. In verse 38, Balaam identifies the angel who spoke to him as delivering the word of God. The angel of the Lord appears to Israel in Judges chapter 2, verse 1-3. through Also, he appears to Gideon in Judges 6, 11-23. The angel of the Lord appears to Manoah and his wife. Uh, verse 16, uh, differentiates himself from God. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord, or unto Manoah. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12, the angel of the Lord pleads with the Lord to have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. In Zechariah chapter 3, Verse 4, the angel of the Lord takes away the sins of the high priest Joshua. Again, it's a few verses, like, okay, there's 10 verses that talk about the angel of the Lord. So how is that that the angel of the Lord could be Jesus or some type of God himself? There's also the angel of God, that's Malach Elohim, which occurs 12 times. Genesis 31, 11, the angel of God calls out to Jacob in a dream. Tells him, I am the God of Bethel. In Exodus 14, 19, the angel of God leads the camp of Israel and also follows behind them with the pillar of fire. Judges 13, 9, the angel of God approached his wife. The same one about Manoah. In addition, there are mentions of God sending an angel. In Exodus 23, Exodus 33, Numbers 20, 1 Chronicles 21, and 2 Chronicles 32. Again, if you take this idea that it's all uh, straight up from God, then there's no nuances. If you have the idea that there was multiple authors, then you can have one one person says the angel of God, some people say the angel of the Lord, the other person says you know just God. So you just have different approaches on how to share the same situation or the same experience. In the Catholic Encyclopedia, they have some stuff about the angel of the Lord being Jesus. So let's, according to Hugh Pope, he writes, 
quote, the earlier father is going by the letter of the text in Septuagint, I intend that if it was God himself who appeared as the giver of the law to Moses, it was not unnatural then for Tertullian, one of the church fathers, to regard such manifestations in light of recluse the incarnation, and most of the Eastern fathers follow the same line of thought. So they thought that it was Jesus appearing before he had incarnated. Uh, Pope quotes the view of Theodoret that this angel was probably Christ. Quote, the only begotten son, the angel of the great council. End quote. In contrast, to the red view with the opposite view of the Latin Father Jerome Augustine, and very great, that it was no more than an angel. So even the church fathers, some of them thought that it was just an angel, but there was some church fathers, and then there's other church fathers that felt different. So they call it a Christophany. But in the Jewish view, we're talking about Metatron being a um, representative of God, and there are books that are what Christians would call intertestamental, the books are in between, ways that people have tried to make sense of these apparitions of either angels or representatives of God and intermediaries. And if those have the same value or authority as they're being given by, by the Christian world, uh, and if they're related somehow to Jesus or the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the intertestamental books the inter testamental books or apocryphal books are the wisdom of Solomon. You know, they would take a passage from the Hebrew. And when they would translate it to the Greek, it would change um, a little bit or when translated to Aramaic. The Pseudepigrapha collection is, is also part of those documents. And in Dead Sea Scrolls, there are uh, many uh, passages in relation to Michael or different messiahs or your Melchizedek. So in in the Drashic text, they have a lot of negative views in relation to um, to the, the two powers or this idea that God has a a, a co uh, creator or co viceroy um, deity or uh, member of, of the Godhead. I really don't like the term Godhead. It's really weird to me. I'm going to find a definition of the Godhead for you guys and see what you think. So you hear that in English, Godhead, Godhead, we, the Godhead, and it just seems like foreign to, to the Bible to use that term. So Godhead, divine nature, according to Webster, divine nature of essence. So is, is the head of God or the, the hood of God or something like that. So this heavenly council that is spoken in, in a lot of different of the papers that we're discussing is uh, something that I still struggle with because there are similarities in other religions where there's, if you look at um, the pantheon, the Greek pantheon of gods, a movie like Clash of Titans, in that movie, they portray a heavenly court of the gods of the Greeks. So you have Zeus and Athena and Poseidon or Neptune. You have all of them, and they're hanging out in, in the clouds, and they're talking about the will, uh, the faith of humankind. It's like the, the super friends or the Justice League. And to introduce that idea to people who study the Bible either from a Jewish or Christian perspective, it is a little difficult because although you see some of that in the book of Job where the adversary goes and challenges God to a duel per se regarding the, the outcome of, of Job and his life, uh, to think that there are that there's these um, people talking to God and kind of making decisions like, it is uh, portrayed in the book of Revelation as a real thing. But, um, again, it's just something that, that I hadn't thought about. We're talking about this idea of the Heavenly Council. They say there's even that within Islam. If God has uh, multiple people that work for him. So there is um, employees of God that can go and do his bidding. And that's what the angels were supposed to do originally. Let me explain what the 
book of uh, Revelation says. Uh, the book of Revelation is made up of multiple apparitions of Jesus. It starts off with Jesus appearing to John of Patmos or one of the Johns that followed Jesus. He uh, is being told, it sounds like he's incarcerated, and he's being told that there are seven congregations that are being judged by Jesus as either faithful or not faithful enough to his message. There's angels and stars and candelabra or I guess menorot or menorahs, and there's all the different things that appear. Then you have um, Jesus um, taking John uh, up to the heavens, and there in the heavens he sees a vision of the different um, thrones, and there's 12 elders who worship God. And in that version, because I believe there's a more ancient version, they also bow down before uh, Jesus that is represented as a lamb. And it's interesting that you only see the term Lamb of God being used in the book of John, Gospel of John. So maybe it is the same John um, who wrote this one. You start seeing all these apocalyptic stuff about how the wrath is coming from heaven against earth and there's different monsters that come out of the, the waters. It's very similar to the book of, I believe, Ezekiel or Zechariah and the different animals or um, uh, chimeras, uh, monsters that have the multiple heads or they're made up of different parts of different animals. They have significance. And then there's persecution of the saints, uh, which some people think that it was persecution of Christians during Nero or it was like a projected idea that Christians or Jewish followers of Jesus would be destroyed by the pagan rulers around them. So uh, the book of Revelation is interesting because it uh, addresses things that uh, there are more Jewish in nature, like worshiping idols, eating on kosher food, it, um, even the way that the wrath is being poured from heaven against the wicked. Uh, it sounds like in the book of Isaiah says that God is like a, a warrior who uh, dips uh, his body in the blood of his enemies, like you do with grapes when they turn into wine. So it's not the typical meek Jesus that you see in the Gospels. It's actually a warrior Jesus who comes to bring uh, vengeance on the enemies of God. So that's that shows that there are different versions or these different visions or how Jesus uh, represents himself to the world. There are some issues there in the relation to who is sitting on the throne and who is worshipped. But overall, the book of Revelation is very Jewish in its flavor um, compared to other apocalyptic works that do not mention Jesus. The reason I bring this up if we're talking about the Trinity is that when Christians uh, make their case for the Trinity, they forget that in the book of Revelation there is. The Spirit is not mentioned much other than, I guess you can say, it could be one of the angels or something like that. And then it changes, uh, like, focus really quick. It goes from speaking to an angel to speaking to Jesus to speaking to uh, God directly or something like that. So there's a lot of strange stuff happening that is hard to to define or uh, make a, a very strong argument for. For those who are who are following our discussion regarding this, I just want you to understand that this is a very complicated thing, and that anybody that claims they understand the nature of God is mistaken because it is uh, in Judaism it teaches that the revelation is something that was given to Moses and the children of Israel. And they had the ability to prophesy. They had the ability to walk with God and hear his voice. We have only glimpses of that. In Judaism, the prophets had a, a vision of God. The mystics had a glimpse of God. And we only have a tiny little uh, once in a while uh, peek at God and his nature. So we as modern men and women, we have limited capacities compared to the great giants that we stand on. So 
it's arrogant to say, oh, I understand how God relates to different beings or manifestations or particular individuals who had a close relationship to him. And there's been simply people throughout history who have had that type of uh, capacity. You know, we were talking about Jewish um, theology. We're talking about the Judaism of Jesus followers. Uh, and then um, I saw a video online called uh, the Jewish Trinity. And I, I was very uh, disturbed by it because it was the typical Christian way of defining God and, and describing him. And it was just wrapped into this type of, the guy's a scholar, so I'll give him that. But he was wrapping it into, you know, Jewish evangelism. And the Jews don't understand their own God. And the rabbis never taught the people the truth. So let me give you the truth. And it was the same, you know, six Bible passages where it's the Spirit and there's God and then there's the Son of God or some other type of Messiah figure. And they're making this huge case for a Jewish trinity. Well, instead of picking a fight with that scholar who, who brought that, I wanted to um, broadcast the, the lecture in a more open way where people can kind of at least uh, see where I'm coming from. So I labeled it uh, the Trinity in Biblical Theology. People feel that their version of their understanding of uh, what it says in the Bible is more accurate than what Judaism teaches. And one of them is one of the, uh, I guess he did his dissertation, I don't know if it's a PhD or a master's in, uh, in religion. Uh, his name is Paul Sobner. And he says, he quotes uh, Shia Cohen, who's a, a Jewish scholar, that says that modern Jewish understanding of God is not what ancient Jew, uh, Jewish understanding of God was. So this is the quote. The Radical monotheism of Maimonides was rare even in the Middle Ages and is unattested in antiquity. So they're saying that modern Orthodox are saying that, you know, Maimonides, you know, nailed it when he said, you know, God is, is one and that's it. There is no partner. There's nothing. They're saying that in biblical times or even uh, right before the Talmud, was, there was multiple um presence of God or manifestations and they work together and that it's easy now to whitewash all that and say, no, 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 we never believe that. And that you can see that in the two powers in heaven uh, controversy that starts up in the Talmud where they say that Elijah ben Abuya saw the two powers or saw Metatron sitting on the throne and he thought there was two powers and he was called a heretic. But that before that, even in the book of Daniel, you see uh, the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne and then the Son of Man comes and he takes the throne or he, he takes the honor from the people. So that there there was always this idea that there was a heavenly court and within that court there was a viceroy or a representative of God that you could say either bore the name of God or acted as a representative of God. And that's where Christians get the idea that Jesus was the angel of the Lord. And when people saw God, they saw the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord was a Christophany. It was a manifestation of God uh, through this vehicle of his son or his uh, somehow representative on earth. So it's almost like um, there's there's two. There's a God in heaven and there's a God on earth. And the God on earth manifests himself physically. And the God in heaven uh, is stays transcendent. So is this kind of like mystical thing that maybe there's a way to to work it out within Jewish mysticism but how do we put it all together because uh we're not we're not questioning people's sincerity we're not questioning people's desire to understand God what we're questioning is the method that they're using to try to understand the God of Israel so in in my introduction to uh the podcast version of this I I talk about how the church fathers had a worldview that did not jive with the worldview of the ancient sages of, of Israel. So if they're taking uh, the Jewish scriptures, which include, um, yeah, I guess to them, it would include not only the Torah, the prophets and the writings, but also the writings of the apostles of Jesus who were also Jewish. And they're interpreting them with 
methods and and other uh, modes of thinking that come from a Greco-Roman understanding, they are making things that are literal figurative. They're making things that are figurative literal. They are making uh, all kinds of different category mistakes because they are not uh, looking at it from this uh, Middle Eastern Jewish perspective. Uh, so we we can go into Kabbalah and how things developed uh, regarding that, but just in a basic understanding of uh, of Hebrew and of, of um, you know ancient uh, Israelite uh, worldview, um, this idea that God is not a, a multiplicity of uh, of persons does not. Uh, there's no evidence for that because it it goes against the whole point of, of a monotheistic faith. How can you have one God that is revealed in three when that is not part of the theology to begin with? So it's, it's like an added theology to an already established uh, concept. I have two stories that I want to share with the first one. In ancient times, there was a king who was loved by his subjects. But this king was not the only ruler. He shared the kingdom with his wife and son. His wife was, was called Lady Wisdom, and his son was called uh, the Chosen One who, who was meant to teach the people. One day, the subjects rebelled against the king and killed his son. He was so sad that he secluded himself, and his wife took over the kingdom, getting the few loyal subjects in a large group of foreigners who followed the teachings of the young man. It is believed he survived the insurrection and now lives in seclusion with his father. And I wrote this as, you know, how do Christians make sense of the Trinity? Uh, Michael Heiser, who was the guy who uh, I'm debating on this, uh, this, this program, is, um, kept on saying that the Holy Spirit was Lady Wisdom in the book of Proverbs, so now, not only is God male as the Father, now there's female God, who's Lady Wisdom. And then Jesus, although he's not considered to be the offspring of both of them, he becomes almost like the third you know, version of God. So you have the old man God, the lady uh, nurturing God, and then you have the, the young warrior or meek uh, teacher or Messiah. And that's how they see it. They see it that once the Messiah left, then the Holy Spirit took over, and the Holy Spirit is the one who's guiding the church. And the Catholics say that, you know, the Holy Spirit is with them and not with anybody else and stuff like that. So that's how they justify this multiplicity of God within itself, that there's three people in relationship with one another. So not only are we talking about the Trinity and the nature of God from a Jewish perspective, we're going to take it to the next level, and um, in, there's a... There's a commentary that I did on the book by Rabbi Bejarano Gutierrez on Jesus' uh, Jewish followers uh, of how you have to look into the sources of what the original followers of Jesus believe as compared to what is told by to us by Jewish history. So I want to, I'll give you the first parable and kind of explain why I think this is important. So um, once there was a king who wanted to connect with his subjects, he sent many messengers to share his decrees and the people under his care heeded to his instructions. By living out these mandates, they became more and more like their ruler. Every once in a while, some of them squandered his teachings or even set up competing outposts against the king. He was compassionate most of the time, but sometimes he had to crush his opponents for the sake of keeping the kingdom unblemished. His kingdom was attacked by foreign powers many times, but he and his subjects overcame many adversities. Until a vast empire rose against the king, they burned down the palace, took the people captive, and the king went into exile. His subjects are now scattered around the world and slowly have been building the kingdom in the land where the palace once stood. The king loves them and supports their efforts, but the empire who destroyed his heritage often maligns him and his followers, claiming that they are of no relevance or value to the world. So to me, this is how the world sees Jews. That there's one God, and he built a kingdom of priests and, and uh, holy people, and that he wanted that to be a light unto the nations. 
and then through different exiles and different conflicts, it kind of lost some of its impetus, and then now is slowly regathering through the Great Exile the last dozen years and becoming a nation again. So that's the Jewish perspective on what's going on. Even God himself is a God who is deeply involved with his people. Connect both parables. So in one, God has a, uh, a kingdom that has multiple leaders in it. And in the other one, God is the only king, and his subjects and him are united at the hip. In the Christian one, God is united to his people through the Holy Spirit, but there's not, like, there is some, some disconnect there. Uh, so I believe the followers of Jesus had a, a middle ground, and this is where I'm going with this. So this is the third parable. There was a king who was an old man and decided to give his kingdom to his son, who was a young warrior. The son decided to disguise himself as a beggar and travel from town to town speaking about the wisdom of his father. The people loved him at first, but then became jealous of him through his vast knowledge. He was arrested and tortured, left for dead. He overcame his injuries and gathered a vast army, but decided to delay his return to avenge his father's honor. He is still awaiting to return and destroy his enemies. However, his father, who is compassionate, keeps telling him to wait a little longer, hoping the people will rise above their animal passions and one day join them in reigning the world together. Is there a connection between Second Temple Judaism and the early Jesus movement? And how does that look like? And according to this parable, now you have uh, a God who is delegating power to this um, some type of prophet, sage, spiritual um, descendant of God. There's different ways that people look at it. But if that is true, then how does that relate to the people who are experiencing that? Because they came from a deeply monotheistic perspective. And I, I will take uh, Dr. Heiser to a challenge that he claims that Jews all believed in some type of double or triple uh, God entity at that time. And I don't really see that. So if they were open to to the Messiah having some type of connection to the divine, that does not mean that the Messiah himself is uh, God in the flesh. And that is the major contention that I would have. But if there is some type of mystical thing, then we can unwrap it just looking at what they believe, not only in some of the books of the New Testament, but in other books that come from the Jewish Christians of that time or the disciples of James, whatever you want to call them. Well, and there is something about, you know, if we're made in the image of God and we have his essence within us, there is uh, a way for us to reconnect with that. And if you have the, the typical Western perspective that we're all sinful sinners who uh, are completely not only cursed and kind of like dismissed by God because of our sin, then where does the connection come from? And they've made it such a narrow perspective that only the people who are willing to accept this very complicated uh, de demanding perspective are the ones who will ever be enlightened and given hope and life by God. Then they're really uh, painting such a gloomy picture that is, that is depressing. It's just everybody is condemned. Only the few who, who truly love Jesus are in. And to me, that doesn't work. I think God is a compassionate God, a, a slow to anger, abounding in love, and that his purpose is for us to reconnect with our true nature, which is one that comes from the creator. So I've heard in mystical search proposals that it's not that God had a son, it's that God has many children, and those are all of us, that we are God's offspring. So it's not radical for someone to say, I'm the son of God, What's radical is to say, I'm the only son of God or the only person who has that type of relationship. But then in the same text, they says that he builds a bridge for people to be able to have the same relationship that he does with God, with all of us. So it's just, uh, again, very complex and very, at times even convoluted, where it's hard to make ends of tales of all these narratives and perspectives and perspectives and perspectives and perspectives and perspectives. And perspectives.